something going on almost every week, and we we, we try to uh, to cover it. Um, bombs bursting in air, and and uh, and all sorts of uh, controversies involving uh, foreign policy and domestic policy. Uh, we've got the campaign going now. You know, everywhere else I go, people are talking about these kinds of things. I ask our listeners to call up and, and discuss this. What do I get? I get nothing. I get nothing. Oh, I get somebody calling up, you know, saying something, a complete non sequitur, something that doesn't even make any sense, you know? It's, uh... And then, then you say something stupid, like, oh, I hear Madonna's got a new dress or something, and oh, right away you get a bingo on the phone lines. No problem. Everybody wants to talk about that nonsense. Who cares? Who cares? Don't you realize there are issues, there are important things that people should be discussing? Why in God's name is that so hard for you dimwits out there? Yeah, dimwits, nitwits, halfwits, and all sorts. That's our audience. Those are the people who, who figure out how to turn on the radio dial. Yeah, those are, that's the elite crust right there. Those people, like, they, they wouldn't know an issue if it smacked them in the face. And then all the other people, the ones who can't figure out how to turn on the radio... They're the ones that, that are out there with their MP3 players and their iPhones and, 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 and listening to the satellite music boxes and whatever else is out there. Yeah, thank you, Judas. Yeah, you're the real traitors. Uh, walk away from, from community radio. You know, the people that could have helped you, the people that could have made you into a better person. <sighs> yeah, it's uh, it, you know, great. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. We get more phone calls now than when we're on the air. All right, people, almost have a bingo here. Almost every single line is lit from people calling in to tell us we're not on the air. Hey, you know what? We know we're not on the air. If we could be on the air, we'd, we'd, we'd flick a switch and do something. But you know what? The switches don't work here. They're all broken. They're all broken. You know why they're broken? Because people like you have not called us and supported us and, and helped us to fix the equipment. Yeah, so now I'm stuck here in, a, in, a, in an isolated studio, uh, going crazy, talking to myself. Nobody else is listening. Even the people in conference, they're all on the phone. They're not even listening to me anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that. Yeah. Saskatchewan, as well as the ACE, the RIA, the IFPI, the MPAA, and other corporate media. And today, I unfortunately do not have any guests. I did have a whole bunch of guests last week, which was total and utter chaos and kind of fun. Well, actually, it wasn't last week. It was this week for my birthday. Just like last year, I had a special birthday edition of this show, which you will eventually get, just like the other previous five episodes or so that are behind in editing, uh, because normally you don't just hear this uh, show on Facebook. You also can hear it on, there's a BitTorrent MP3 available, there's a Mega, a cloud service for storing MP3s also will have it, as well as BitChute, OK.ru, which, let's see if I can actually pronounce it. 
this uh, or try to mangle the pronunciation of this particular website. It's kind of like, apparently it's a Facebook for Slavic boomers. Let's see, Odnoklaskniki, if I'm pronouncing that right, as well as NSA Alphabet YouTube, Brighthian, of which it looks like a, I guess, right-wing free video hosting service, but hey, they'll host my videos, as well as Buzzsprout, Podchaser, Deezer, Listen Notes, Player.fm, as well as Podcast Addict, and am I missing any? Occasionally, other places as well. So for those of you who are listening and thinking, oh, this is just something Jeff does on Facebook, or this is just something Jeff does on YouTube, or this is just something that Jeff does on one particular service or streaming site, it's not. I've been trying for the past almost two years now to broadcast on as many places as I can, as many places that are still free as in speech, uh, enough that they'll let my words go on and be echoed and downloaded and listened to and streamed and whatnot. Because it's important to play out and to try to have someone going out there with their feelers and trying to find the media that is still free, that is still there enough that people with information that is important to share can actually share it. Media that you can talk about things like, for example, WikiLeaks and their particular data releases that they occasionally come up with. And the things like, for example, the Kelp thing release of the uh, WikiLeaks when that particular issue happened, something that I think not a lot of people, especially in countries where there is a lot of media consolidation, really were following at the time that it was happening. Unless you were on somewhere like Twitter, on somewhere like YouTube, which for a long time, both of those places had a very freewheeling availability of a lot of different kinds of information. Anyone with VHS tapes or DVDs of old short things that were interesting or potentially interesting to someone out there in the World Wide Web would post it onto YouTube and now is posting on to places like BitChute and the what is it, IPFS networks and so on and so forth. The technology is slowly changing and there's new things happening in the technology world, etc. But there's still this need to have a place where people can share information and share and talk about what's going on. Another thing I've been trying to do with this show for years is to have other people in the conversation. So it's not just Jeff blabbing in front of a microphone or blabbing in front of his laptop so that it is something of a coherent and look at what's going on in the world around us. And so the reason why I'm going at this high level of describing what I've been doing is because this is the end of this podcast series, or at least next show, next week will be. I have decided to put an end to this particular format in this particular show. And it has become, for those of you who've tried to do something like this, who've tried to do anything consecutively every week for almost two years, you'll find that there are challenges involved with it. And some of those challenges are starting to be more than the, the value I find that this show is providing, at least in my life. So as far as this show, you will get one more show out of me, but then that's it. And unfortunately, all the guests that I'd hoped to bring in, we've run the clock down. And so the you'll have the next show to look forward to, but that's it. So, but continuing on with what's going on in the world. There's one video I wanted to get to for quite some time now. So I'm going to play a little clip of an interview from InfoWars, which the Alex Jones show, this was published before the U.S. election, late, I guess not last year, but two years ago now, where there was a lot of people being cancelled and people being removed from Twitter and from Patreon, which is pausing for a moment. Another reason why you'll see that I don't use Patreon. I don't use payment systems that are already politicized to the point where if you're the wrong person, if you're, you have the wrong politics, if you have the wrong worldview, that your credit card can actually be canceled for you, that you, your ability to make a living as a podcaster, as a broadcaster, as someone who speaks and, and makes a living through your, your work or your art or your music or whatever, if the means of payment, the means of collecting money that can prevent you from making art based on what their worldview is and what they limit your ability to say, that in my view is totally wrong. And it is a deeper form, a more insidious form of censorship, I think, than a lot of other types and a lot of more obvious ways that 
people can be removed from the conversation, the global conversation, that people's voices can be removed from the global harmony and melody of the world. And so Patreon is guilty of this. They have been removing people here and there. Visa and MasterCard are guilty of this. They kept WikiLeaks, the canary in the coal mine, at the time from being able to raise funds to fund its operations. Anything that is ruled or governed uh, by the rules set by FinCEN or the SEC is guilty of this. Ripple Labs is guilty of this. And there's been a really big market crash in the, the world of Ripple Labs' uh, in-house currency, the uh, XRP. And I am not really concerned about that at all because the company, Ripple Labs or Ripple, the not the network, the idea, but the company that has been built to promote this that company has been trying to sup with the devil. It's been trying to find that middle ground where the U.S. government can be happy with a coexisting cryptocurrency that threatens its very existence. Of course, it can't. There is a fundamental disconnect between organizations like Ripple Labs and, and organizations that, like the exchanges here in Canada, most of which don't exist anymore because the government has stepped in and tried to force people to have these exchanges, these money transfer companies, everything under the control so that when they say this person is now removed from our society, that they have to comply. And so things like Patreon, things like Visa and MasterCard, they are subject to this. And they have been for many years, probably over a decade, been used as a weapon to silence the unpopular and silence those who say things that those in power don't like, or to silence those with evidence of crimes being committed by those with power and those with the hands on the political machinery. We've talked about in previous episodes about some of the cheating going on uh, and some of the shenanigans going on at the U.S. election this week, uh, you, not last week, but the one to come, is going to be a bit of a focal point in terms of who continues or begins to rule the United States at the executive branch level. And although President-elect Biden is the president-elect and is most likely to survive this week and continue to become the president of the United States. There's still shenanigans going on and both sides are still cheating. Both sides are still trying their best to get their hands on that slippery, greased position of authority. But I'm getting kind of sidetracked here. So uh, this is a video from InfoWars show. So let's get into that video and go from there. Saying, hey, we know you got uh, independence from the British. We want independence as well. And I see it as very legitimate because they never voted to be part of communist China, it's a dictatorship. And so I don't want to stir them up. I know that certain elements, even Hillary said, okay, we're with the democracy people. Uh, and, and you know, Hillary you know, sees something to cut away from China now because she knows that's US policy. But so I'm not for regime change, but this isn't regime change. This is an autonomous, free group of people who ran for their lives, their parents, their grandparents 70 years ago. So I can only support what they're doing and, and, and their courage and the incredible footage that Paul Watson for InfoWars and the rest of our crew has gotten there has just been uh, just incredible. I know I'm ranting, but... Oh, no, I, I mean, no one voted to be part of communist China. That's the problem with it, isn't it? So, I mean, there's not... I don't think there's anything good that's going to come of being given to China. No one wants to be part of China. No one wants to be part of that system. It's, it genuinely is Orwell's nightmare sprung to life. And now the people of Hong Kong who have, like say, for the last 50 or so years, have had liberty in their country are about to lose that because of a treaty. It was like, wasn't it like a 99-year lease or something like that? Yes. That, that's right. So, yeah. So after and by the way, we're getting old. 1949 yeah. to, 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 to 2019, that, that's, that's a long time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so they're about to lose that. 70 years. Yeah. They're about to lose that because of a treaty that was made before they were even born. And through no fault of their own, and they don't appear to have any democratic means of resisting it. It's really terrible, actually. Well, like you said, if, you, if people think Tiananmen Square, uh, Tiananmen Square was bad, this is going to be explosive. And like you said, yeah. they're massing hundreds of thousands of troops, thousands of armored vehicles, and, and shelling drills on TV, saying they could invade in, in the next few weeks. Oh, yeah, I, I would, I'm honestly really worried about what's going to happen. I've been asking a lot of questions here, but the 20 minutes or so we have left, uh, let's get into an issue that obviously affects everybody watching and listening to this, and that's censorship. But I don't even call this censorship. The documents we've gotten from Google and Facebook and others is it's total information management of what everybody can see. And Eric Schmidt, the former head of Google, said our future goal, he said this in 2013, 
2014 is that you only get one search when you search something. The correct search that we decide you're supposed to get. He said that on Charlie Rose. Very really. That's very chilling. And that's what horrifies me is people think, oh, it's just Alex Jones. Because I know I wasn't that important. They chose me because they could demonize me, build a straw man. Then when I got taken off the air, people say, oh, that's just him. And then the precedent would be set. And, and the whole thing could collapse, and now the dominoes are all going down. Well, that's the reason I'm here. I mean, it was obviously unjust when you got tanked from absolutely every single platform in a matter of days. And this, this was, it was obviously a coordinated attack on your liberty, an attack on your free speech. There's no question of it. And it could, if it can happen to you, it can happen to anyone. You were the canary in the coal mine. And then we're seeing it further and further. I mean, like, Paul Justin Watson got pulled off of Facebook and Instagram for an, an, interview, an interview with Tommy Robinson from like three years ago or something like this. And then you get um, Stephen Crowder gets demonetized, his entire channel demonetized, just because um, some guy at Vox.com didn't like him. And it's like, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. YouTube even said that Crowder had done nothing wrong. But the Twitter mob put pressure on YouTube and YouTube came and said, well, we'll demonetize it. And even then, that wasn't good enough. Even then. They were still agitating to get his entire channel, his livelihood taken away. And that's the future that we're looking at, when YouTube came to angry Twitter mobs. That has to stop. And, and expand on that, Facebook a few months ago, when they added myself and Paul and a few others to that list, they said they are the most banned, and you can only say their name or website if it's in a negative way to, to repudiate them. And so they said, you can't even say their name or their website unless you're attacking them, so that's social engineering people to attack us. Yeah, I'm probably going to get banned from Facebook for being on this. Um, and so Sargon doesn't seem to have been correct in that last statement. From everything I could dig up in the maybe 15 minutes before the show, it does seem like Facebook has allowed him to stay. However, that leads right into this article here, which is Facebook, quote, just announced it's banning seven of its most dangerous accounts. Here's the full list and why they did it. The official count is six human beings who are also brands, along with a media company run by one of them. Uh, he's escaped uh, Facebook's uh, grasp here. So, uh, but he did get banned from, let's see, Patreon. And there's an article here. Uh, Patreon explains why they deplatformed. Like, why do we even have a word for this? It's, it's pretty sad that we have a word. But yeah, they deplatformed him. The Reddit has silenced his subreddit. Uh, which, by the way, was a pretty active place. Uh, before I got banned from Reddit, I could see that there was conversation going on there. And it's also important to note that when he got banned, it wasn't just as some guy or some YouTube personality or something like that, but he was actually running for public office. And he was running for public office. And so this was de facto Reddit stepping in and manipulating the elections of the UK MEP election. So this would be the elections for those who would represent a particular part of the UK in the European Union Parliament. So this is a, actually quite a big deal. It would be like if Reddit had censored some NDP candidate here in Saskatoon, like what Ashley Hicks or uh, Sinos or something like that. So it is important to note when that happens, but it's not just Patreon. It's not just Reddit. Uh, Twitter also suspended his account uh, when he had 11,000 followers, which... I mean, it's not super huge, but it's about as big as my biggest account. Uh, it is noteworthy enough, right? And again, this is while he's running for public office. Agree or disagree with his politics or his rhetoric or anything like that. He's been had his channel demonetized. This is his, the way that he's made a living for the most part. YouTube demonetized him, so all of the ads and the money that he would get from ads from YouTube, all of that suddenly stopped coming in. So this is a coordinated attack from the tech platforms like YouTube and Reddit, on him, a person, a politician, so, uh, Sargon of Cat, for the things that he says and for the, the ideas that he has. Agree or disagree with. And he put it right, where it isn't just that Alex Jones or Sargon of Cat is being uh, targeted here. If it can happen to them, it can happen to anyone. And it has happened to me. I got banned from Twitter. I got banned from Reddit. It, these things around the same time. Once the machinery for censorship was put in place, it was used. And it was increasingly used and normalized. With the use of being able to just have the tech platforms just pick a winner of a political contest and have the opponents of that winner just suddenly not exist anymore. 
and not even be discussable unless you're t saying negative things about them. But there's a couple of other interesting things from that little clip, which is I actually started a little bit early so that we talk a little bit about Hong Kong because it is worth pointing out that while all this is going on, there is the, or there was this struggle for the basic human rights and democratic rights in Hong Kong that kind of went under the carpet as soon as it uh, came out, which is important to note in itself. But the other thing too is that there's this discussion about Google and Google deciding how to filter the world for all of its viewers and something like I can't remember what the, the number was but a huge percentage of the world has cell phones and has internet and uses google google is a, a massive massive filter for the world right now and if you're hearing this it is probably because you are hearing it via some kind of google platform or service or software and if even without considering the google search just being able to control the platform and filter out what is authoritative news? Who is forbidden from being spoken about? This is a massive amount of power. I don't think in 2019 they even fully understood. Even the most paranoid, i.e. Alex Jones, really understood how deep this filtering could go. And there's a book out there by Julian Assange, when WikiLeaks meant Google, I think, that goes into a little bit of the detail of what Google had been planning from way, way, way back. And so Alex Jones brought up that quote about how there's going to be that one search and it's the definitive search, etc. And yeah, they've been do thinking about that since then, but it's the paper trail actually goes a little bit further back. And it's interesting to point that out. And I think they're also making a mistake that I don't think I would have even seen when I first saw that video. Sargon at the time, perhaps understandably so, was mostly worried about Twitter mobs and people getting pissed off and then demanding for someone to be censored in silence and then that person gets censored in silence because the companies involved have no backbone to stand up for their users and say, okay, no, we actually want people to have some kind of freedom in this society that we live in to say and believe things and to privately communicate amongst themselves, etc. Going back to the, the video on where I talked to Daniel in Hawaii, where he was talking about how it was a private message from his friend to his other friend that got the one banned from Facebook. Like this, this isn't to view this purely in terms of a public figure being lost is to miss the, the full machinery and the full picture of what is going on. But these Twitter mobs, and they exist, they've been around for a long time, and I don't think we're going to be getting rid of angry mobs, but there's having Twitter have the ability to filter what people see and what people see enough to be angry about. It's, I think it's a mistake to see them as an angry mob. Maybe we don't have a word for it yet. Maybe IE or, I'm blanking on the, the, the other word to describe large groups of organized people, um, but the, the, there are a couple of concepts of like organized human beings that the might be more accurate than mob, but even though historically in the British perspective, maybe angry mob is what you would see it as, but on Twitter, because there's this filter present, because people are able to, when they log into Twitter, if you have the right political vantage point that supports Twitter's interests, that supports Twitter's corporate interests, you will be seen. If you don't have that, viewpoint if you're not leaning in that direction you won't get seen just like now none of my videos on ok.ru are getting even any views uh, there my youtube videos it's interesting to compare and contrast youtube with bitchute because bitchute is a lot smaller than youtube and yet i'm getting more views from bitchute so there's something going on there too where it there's if you're too far outside of the overton window the platform itself is starting to filter you out so that you're not getting seen so you're not getting retweeted you're not getting shared etc and so when that happens when you have a mob of people who are being funneled in a certain direction to have rage in a certain way to have that two minutes of hate or whatever from 1984 to have the official enemy of the platform as the target of their rage then yes, there's going to be people who are angry. There's going to be organized people who want to be angry together. This is not something that's going away in any of the platforms, or, or at least Twitter is not doing anything to stop. What it's doing is it's focusing the direction of their anger. It's focusing it in a way that allows them to target their opponents. This may or may not be conscious. This may be just the output of their uh, black box algorithm. Hard to say without access to it. But the point here is that it's not that it's the angry mob that's that's built up to do this. It's that the to see Twitter as a collection of angry mobs misses one of the important points. It misses one of the parts that, that allows Twitter to be as powerful as it is. It's a coherent angry mob. It is a directed angry mob. It is a angry Twitter mob. It is a tool, like a cell phone is a tool that allows you to take 
an angry mob and to have them do a certain thing, right? We talk about and we think about Occupy. We talk about and we think about the Arab Spring. We talk about and we think about all these activities because the technology allowed for people to organize in a certain way and, and not organize in other ways. Twitter organizes people in certain ways. It organizes people in certain directions. And those directions are slowly but surely being aligned with the interests of Twitter itself and its shareholders. And so it's important to see that okay? and to note that people like, for example, Carl Benjamin, Sergei Burkett, Alex Jones are the targets. And so when you see someone who is a target of this much vitriol, institutionalized vitriol and political power being directed at them, it's worth taking some time and to seeing what exactly are they saying? Because maybe, maybe they're totally off whack, right? Maybe he, his Gamergate ideas are totally wrong. Maybe you'll listen to his words and you'll still disagree with him. And that's fine. That's totally okay. And maybe you'll still support the EU. You'll still support X, Y, and Z. And that, that's all right. But there's something that they are getting at. Something that they are doing that is threatening YouTube and Twitter and Patreon and those who control it. And that thing, whatever it is, some part of it, there's a grain of truth there. And it's a kind of, it's, it's a, a truth that cannot be spoken right now a truth that cannot be portrayed accurately on the internet, or at least in areas like Patreon and uh, Twitter and YouTube, etc. There are places still out there that are free enough to carry it. BitChute is failing. BitChute right now does allow for a lot of free expression. It doesn't allow for people like me to upload their videos. None of my videos have been censored off of BitChute yet, but you can see it coming. BitChute is becoming the kind of venture capital being sold to a bigger company, being sold to a bigger company. They're trying to portray themselves as kind of the future of video and a, a competitor to YouTube. And they're only going to be able to pull this off and get the kinds of funding that they're going to get from woke capital, perhaps, from if they start to implement these censorship tools that the other platforms have. And there's already talk of this happening. So BitChute is effectively lost. But it's not just Bitchu. There's also a blog, I'm starting to fail to remember if I already talked about this a little bit, but it's worth talking about twice even if I have, which is the Slate Star Codex blog, which it is basically one of the people who is part of the less wrong, I don't want to say community, but discussions. And it is a uh, person, an anonymous person, who did not want their identity released to the world because they say things that go outside of the Overton window sometimes. They've allowed for discussions to take place between people like, for example, who supported Sargon of Akkad and Alex Jones and then other people who are hold high political office in the Democrat and Republican sides. And he just allows for some level of moderated, like not freewheeling, but moderated discussion on important issues, things that are worth going into. And when he was interviewed by the New York Times, they were able to, as part of that interview, figure out his real name and his real identity. And they were basically threatening to publish it. So his response was to take his whole blog down and to go dark and to just go right off of the web. And this is a huge loss because he's published all kinds of really deep, meaningful thought into the, the most divisive issues of our day. And those outside of, some of those outside of the Overton window, in, in an attempt to make sense of those who disagreed strongly with the, the status quo, the Orthodox, etc. And so he's got an update here from, let's see, when is this update? It's September 11th of all times. And so he hadn't heard anything from the New York Times. And so nothing was published. Quote, I'd assume that they dropped the article, except that they approached an acquaintance for another interview, interview last month. Overall, I'm confused. So in other words, the New York Times probably doesn't see the importance of privacy, the importance of allowing him to continue to exist, the importance of allowing him to have this space in his life where his professional life is not impacted by being known as this really famous blogger. But, quote, they definitely haven't given me any explicit reassurance that they won't reveal my private information. And now that I publicly admitted that privacy is important to me, something that I tried to avoid coming on too strong about before for the, exactly this reason, some people have taken it upon themselves to post my real name all over Twitter in order to harass me. Probably inadvertently stress and affected myself with all this, but I still think it was the right thing to do. Quote, at this point, I think maintaining an anonymity is a losing battle. So I'm gradually reworking my life to be compatible with the sort of publicity that circumstances seem to be forcing on me. I talked with my employer and we came to a mutual agreement that I would gradually transition away from working there. So his life is totally upturned because of this article and those who had access to his name through it. 
Um, so he's talking about starting his own private practice and making good of it. And quote, I think I'd feel safer if, as part of a big group that specifically promises to defend their bloggers when needed, i.e. not just abandoning <laughs> their users uh, to the internet hate machine, as it were. Quote, and also I'd feel safer with a lot of diverse income streams and Substack has made me a, an extremely generous offer. Okay. So he's going towards Substack on that side. So he's, he's reaching out to his readers to figure out what to do next. And this is, as far as I know, still the current situation on his particular blog. So I slate Stark Codex a little bit. I didn't usually get very deep into it as much as I would have liked to, because as well written and as well thought as it was, it was built on top of Less Wrong, which is in turn built on top of Overcoming Bias. And so I would tend to, tend to just go deep enough into it, the, the tree of links until I found the Overcoming Bias stuff and then just slowly climbed up the mountain from there. So it's interesting that that's still going on. And so his particular blog seems to be done and over with, but he's an interesting guy to keep an eye on. So that's one of the people who were canceled effectively because of the, the actions of those who control things like the payment processing systems, etc. So there was also, uh, so Substack, uh, Substack launches Defender, a program offering legal support to independent writers, which is, again, a very important thing for this to exist on some level, that there needs to be this kind of legal defense for legal attacks and lawfare attacks on those who want to do journalism. Going back to the, the Thunder Bay podcast and the case study on Thunder Bay is the news desert, and that's the one piece that's missing in places like Thunder Bay and increasingly elsewhere in the world as, as journalist outfits and news outfits become compromised, that the thing you need is legal defense more than anything. So that's good to know that it's still around. Uh, let's see here. We've got from Lumerd, quote, Michelle Malkin suspended from Twitter, remaining violent tweets from leftists ignored. So this is another one of those ratcheting arguments. I'll refer to the, the ratcheting argument article on that, but where they're complaining that about two things at once. One, that some people aren't getting censored and that two, they are getting censored. And so I don't really agree that uh, they're complaining about people not getting censored because that's basically just asking for more censorship of the form that she got caught up on. But quote, conservative author and outspoken free speech activist Michelle Malkin was suspended on, from Twitter on Wednesday. This is Wednesday, mid, late May, early June, 2020. Quote, with the platform demanding that she remove a May 29th tweet where Malkin responds to the writing and looting across the country. The tweet in question reads as follows, quote, in case I wasn't clear, violent criminal looters should be shot, quote unquote. Twitter claimed that the tweet violated the Twitter rules specifically for, quote, rules against abuse and harassment. So, quote, Malkin immediately filed an appeal, which means she will not have any access to her account until there's some decision made by Twitter. If Malkin deletes the tweet, there will be another 12 hours before Malkin's account is unlocked, giving her access. And then, quote, Malcolm told the National File in an exclusive statement with American Gulf in spreading flames because of the riots, is more important than ever that law-abiding citizens have the unfettered freedom to demand consequences for violent criminal behavior. Twitter has rigged the social media playing field for years. This is systemic, coordinated gaslighting by Silicon Valley and cultural Marxists, which I, I saw, I don't think I have the comic on hand, but there's an interesting comic that came up this week of Karl Marx and, uh, what's his name? Engels at the dinner table discussing how in the 21st century, certain forms of European architectures would be uh, not allowed and uh, things along those lines of like, refer. I know that the, the conservatives tend to want to label everything that they don't like as Marxist. And I'm sure that some of the gaslighting in question is being done by those that would probably consider even themselves to be Marxists. But I find cultural Marxist is a little bit overly broad and too easy to paint people with a term. But anyway, the minor, minor point. Quote, I'm not an insider of violence. I'm a defender of the peace. Quote, of course, lots of people say that who are actually violent. I mean, the blank of peace uh, <laughs> can be used in many, many different ways uh, by violent groups. And I don't think there's any contest there. So that's kind of an empty thing to say, but at least they're giving lip service to peace as this kind of valuable thing, but whatever. Quote, every day Twitter allows Antifa to dox and harass journalists and Trump supporters. Every day Twitter allows BLM agitators to incite ex escalating violence against cops. I hope that those still remaining on the platform will redouble their efforts to expose the double standards and speak up against anarchy. Of course, I'm on the pro-anarchy side, but regardless, it's the sentiment there expressed. 
this idea of if you're going to be violent to me, then there's a consequence to that, right? It's not that far. I think that regardless of your political vantage point, regardless of, of how you think about the particular situation she was referring to, there is going to be a level where if people are violent to you, you'll respond in kind. And that is at the root of what she's trying to get across. So that is the thing that is forbidden to express on Twitter, I think. And that is the problem here is that there is this gap, this idea that we can act without consequences, that we can threaten others without consequences if they're the right kind of people. And that we can do bad things and violent things to people and not even expect that it'll be legal for them to, to do anything in response. So it's, it's interesting that Twitter would go to that point. And so the article goes on and talks about how they're going to go to Parler, which again, isn't going to be any better. Parler is going to have the same problems. The in-group and out-group might change a little bit, but there's still going to be censorship on Parler. You need to find a better platform conservatives. So that was going on as well. Let's see. Then the next article quote, Twitter censors Michelle Malkin clip about tech censorship after presidential retweet. So the president retweets her tweet and then boom, she's uh, censored again. So quote Trump, this is from the Daily Groiper, which is a somewhat extremist right news source from my perspective here. So quote, earlier today, Trump stated in quote, tweet of the video posted by AF Clips. That's the, what is AF Clips? America first. So yeah, these guys are like far right, but whatever. That quote, the radical left is in total command of the popular social media platforms. He alluded that the administration is looking into taking action against the quote, illegal situation and thanks thanked Malkin for speaking out. And then it shows a before and after, before the Malkin tweet was censored, and then after, so it's like clearly on. And then they complain about this tweet being removed. Quote, it would be, according to those close to the White House, the uh, Trump Justice Department, along with the state's attorney general, are likely to sue Google uh, in the coming months for violations of antitrust law. So again, this is like foreshadowing stuff that may or may not have actually happened. Go to the show we did uh, with uh, Devin on the Google antitrust situation on that side, which is probably around that period of time. So, I quote, it would be the first time that the administration has taken action against Silicon Valley and a major step in the crucial fight against censorship. So regardless, again, of whether or not you agree with the Groiper and their worldview or their politics or whatever, they're interested in fighting against censorship. And that's a thing to notice because in when we have this, censorship machine that has been built uh, to manage the worldviews and to do a total information availability and total information management, that being able to have any kind of a push against it is a good thing. And to have a, a, the space to have access to the truth is an important thing to take notice of. So it's not just the, the far right. It's not just the liberal centrists in the UK, like Sargon, it's, quote, a teenager posted about her COVID-19 infection on Instagram. This is from Reason. Quote, a deputy threatened to arrest her if she didn't delete it. Quote, a family in Oxford, Wisconsin, is suing the local sheriff's department after a patrol sergeant threatened to arrest a teenage girl for disorderly conduct for posting an Instagram about being affected or infected with COVID. Amia Kohun, if I'm pronouncing that right, is a student at Westfield Area High School in Westfield, Wisconsin. According to the lawsuit, and they have a link, uh, she and schoolmates went to Disney World and Universal Studios in Florida after a spring break trip in early March 2020, right? As the coronavirus was beginning to spread and businesses began to shut down. She and her classmates canceled the trip early and returned home. Once home, Kuhn began developing symptoms, i.e. probably go to Disneyland or something, Florida, associated with COVID-19. Uh, she sought medical assistance, but at the time was unable to test to see if she was infected. She was diagnosed with an upper respiratory infection with her symptoms consistent with COVID-19. According to the lawsuit, she went home, posted on Instagram, i.e. this is what young girls do, they, those with access to Instagram, <laughs> post everything, they've got selfies, they take pictures, it's a very common thing, 2020, for Instagram users to go out and take pictures and to share it on Instagram. So it's just like Facebook, it's super common. So quote, uh, letting people know that she had COVID and that she was in self harm Her condition worsened and she was brought to the hospital for treatment. She posted again about the experience on Instagram. Finally, they were able to test her, but the test came back negative. According to the lawsuit, doctors told her it was likely she missed the window for testing positive, but she probably did have COVID-19 despite the test results. False negative results have been an ongoing issue in accurately diagnosing infections, i.e. 
it is likely that she had it. Her own doctors say this, so who are we out here in the rest of the world to dispute that quote? Especially given she was in a country where this sort of thing was happening. Maybe she didn't have it, but it's likely she did. But regardless, quote, after she returned home from this visit, she posted again on Instagram. She's posting constantly, but whatever. So, and included a picture of herself at the hospital wearing an oxygen mask. The very next day, Patrol Sergeant Cameron Klump from the Market County Sheriff's Department showed up on the family's doorstep. He was under their under orders from Sheriff Joseph Conrath to demand that Amia and her father, Richard Cahoon, remove the Instagram posts. If they refused, Klump said, the family faced charges for disorderly conduct, and Klump told them that he would start taking people to jail, according to the suit. And so, goes on to say that they dispute that they were making the infection up, that the Cohen complied and deleted the, quote, allegedly illegal Instagram post, but then, quote, the family then connected with the Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty, and the Institute sent a letter to Conrad warning him that he had violated the Cohen's First Amendment rights and demanded both an apology and a promise that there would be no further threats. And it kind of goes on from there. So let's see here, you can read the complaint. Let's actually see. This is a while ago now, so let's see if there's been an update very quickly. No, no updates. So you can actually find her on Instagram. I'm not going to go into too far because she is young-ish and may not know and realize that she, of the, the media attention, that's something that she can kind of choose later in life. But it's interesting that the media, the other media had no problem naming her. So that's kind of an interesting thing. But most importantly, though, I think it's that, like, this is not just political activists and dissidents and blowhards like Alex Jones and a Sargon of a Cad who are targeted by this, but this goes right down to the deep level of young girls using Instagram, right? It is the censorship and willingness of people to just point at things that are politically uncomfortable and say, no, this can't be allowed. We're going to force you to delete this or we're going to force you to not say this, or it's being pushed further and further down into both American society here in Canada, Canadian society and elsewhere. And the availability of a place where uncomfortable truths can even be expressed becomes more and more and more important the more this happens. And so the, I guess this is probably about as long as I want to go this week, but the, the important thing to note is here, this can happen to you. This sort of thing can happen. It is happening to normal people. It is happening to abnormal people. It is happening all the time around you. If you spend your time looking, you can find examples like this. My ability to find out about this is because of websites like Reason, websites like The Daily Griper, websites like Lumerd, websites like Infowars, The Fediverse. Even just having access to The Fediverse allows you to if something like this happens, to share it and to learn when other people do share it. And so just being willing to be open-minded enough to read news sources that you don't necessarily agree with, things like the Daily Griper, for example, you don't necessarily have to agree with their politics, but just to see when they say something is going on, when they have some information about what's going on, when they bother to do any kind of journalism to, worth speaking about, at least you're aware of it and that somebody in your community is aware of it. Not everyone has to read every news source. I've got a list of, I think, 19,600 different points of information and people that are available on the web to check up on and to learn things about what's going on in the world from. But everyone can do that. Just like every time you find a source of information, don't just take their word for it. See what sources they cite and then keep track of that. Come back to them later. See what they share later on. Don't necessarily take the word of one news source. Don't necessarily take the word of the BBC unless you have some other source that you can balance it against, for example. But anyway, it's worth going into these cases when they happen because, again, when someone is censored, that's the sign that you should pay a little bit more attention to them. That's the sign that in however you're managing what to give your attention, that maybe an extra slice of your attention can be directed towards them and the things that they say, just to see, just to see what is being, what books are being burned, what ideas are, are too dangerous to see the light of day, what ideas are too dangerous to have free reign and to be expressible on systems like Twitter. But if you appreciate the, these dangerous ideas and having access to them in a show like this, even though next show is going to be the last show, you still have the ability to support that last show. So you can go to subscribestar.com slash Jeff dash cliff.
and support this show because so far nobody has. And this is one of the reasons why this format isn't working is that despite in two years, not a single supporter has been found. So that could be you. You could be the, the first supporter of this show. It could happen. And if there's anything you'd like me to talk about on the last show next week, definitely send me an email, uh, jeffreyduckworth at gmail.com. And with that, I will leave out with the goodbye song, because I haven't played that in a while. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Okay, but in the meantime, always remember to be good and so... Just a moment.